Good afternoon to everyone. My name is uh, John Ligeros. I'm from ETH uh, Zurich. And this afternoon, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, semi-plenary, one of the two semi-plenary talks of this afternoon uh, by Professor Ching, uh, Chang Zhong. Uh, Professor Zhong is a colleague uh, from uh, Illinois, Illinois Institute of Technology. He did his studies, at, uh, completed two PhDs, uh, one at Imperial College in 2004 and the other one from Shanghai Jiatong University in uh, 2000. He then joined the faculty at the University of Sheffield uh, as a professor before moving to the Illinois Institute of Technology where he is now serving as the Max McGraw Endowed Chair uh, in Energy and Power Engineering. His research covers a broad range of topics uh, in power electronics, power systems, and control, and he's the author of uh, three monographs and a forthcoming one uh, on, on these topics. And he's also uh, a, a, a member of the IFAC family in a sense. He serves as the vice chair on two of our technical committees on power and energy systems and on linear control systems. So he's one of the experts uh, in, in the area of power systems, and this is also the topic of his uh, talk uh, uh, this afternoon uh, on synchronized and democratized smart grids. So please join me in welcoming him, Professor Zhang, to the stage. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for staying with us. It's my great honor to be here to share with you our thinking over the last 15 years about sustainability and the future power systems, what we call centralized and democratized smart grid, in short, Sendan. I would really like to thank President Zheng Chun and his team for inviting me and the nominators for nominating me. I enjoyed the performance last night here very much, and I'm sure you did so as well. It demonstrated perfect harmony, and this is a key word in my talk today, harmony. We live with the power systems and electricity every day. In 2000, the US National Academy of Engineering selected electrification as the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century. Power systems are also regarded as the largest and the most complex machine engineered by humankind. Power systems are getting even larger. In Europe, a lot of high voltage transmission lines are planned to link the power systems of member states together. In the US, a lot of high voltage AC links and the DC links are being built to link the Eastern interconnection, Western interconnection, and Texas interconnection together. In China, a lot of high voltage DC links and high voltage AC links have been built to form a smart and strong power system in China. At the same time, power systems are being democratized as well. A huge number of relatively small renewable energy sources, um, such as wind turbines, solar panels, and also electric vehicles and electricity systems are being added onto the grid. We have often heard that the emerging of renewable energy and the internet technology is creating a powerful third industrial revolution. So power systems are getting larger with a huge number of relatively small distributed generators added to the system. This causes unprecedented challenges to power systems and may lead to blackouts. This slide shows you the top 10 blackouts happening in the world. Five years ago, the largest blackout in the world happened in India, where 670 million people were left without electricity. Last year, in September, a blackout happened in South Australia, where 850,000 people were left without electricity. The final report says that this is due to the increased amounts of non synchronous and inverter collected plants. So, there are many possible reasons for a blackout, but for us, system engineers, the question for us is that how to sustain growth and maintain stability? This is very challenging, right? History often has the answer for questions like this. When we talk about history, 
we have to talk about China. Let's spend 100 seconds on the history of China. Please, video. Thousands of years ago, several cultures emerged in the East, where China is now. About 5,000 years ago, Chinese characters were invented and have been evolving since then. About 2,300 years ago, that land was highly democratized with hundreds of schools of thought, such as Confucianism, Legalism, Taoism, and Moism. However, it was filled with chaos and bloody battles. In 221 BC, Emperor Qin united China and unified Chinese characters, currency, trade, and communication. This has laid a structurally stable foundation for Chinese culture. He means harmony. It lies in the center of Chinese culture and has safeguarded its stability and prosperity, even after being invaded. With this, Chinese made great inventions such as printing, paper making, compasses, and gunpowder. This harmonizing principle has also been instrumental for 1.4 billion Chinese to live in harmony. Today, I will talk about how to harmonize democratized power systems with this principle to make our planet more sustainable. This is the outline of my talk. I will start recalling the challenges being faced in power systems in order to identify the fundamental challenge behind the scene. I will then present the critical concept of synchronization and democratization in short syndrome. I will talk about the two key um, features that are rule of law and legal equality for syndrome smart grid. I will then propose the technical routes to implement syndrome smart grids followed by the syndrome grid architecture. Before I finish my talk, I will outline the latest developments, the test beds we created, and the large-scale industrial demonstration carried out and together with the future directions for, for the research. We have talked about that power systems are facing a lot of challenges. Power systems are getting larger with increasing consumption. Generators are becoming smaller, but the number of generators is fast growing because of a large-scale utilization of renewable energy, electric vehicles, and energy storage systems. Power systems need to be more efficient as well. We all understand these challenges, literally, but what do these challenges really mean? What is the fundamental challenge behind these challenges? Let's look at them one by one. Power systems are getting larger with increasing consumption. We are adding a lot of devices, appliances, uh, high volt DC um, uh, fax devices into the power system. If you look at all these devices you're adding to, basically most of them come with uh, power electronic converters. So the first challenge means more power electronic converters are being added to power systems. The second challenge, large scale utilization of renewable energy, electric vehicles, and energy storage system. This also means more power electronic converters are being added to the system because the electricity generated from renewable energy sources is not compatible with the electricity we use. Often it comes in as DC. Electric vehicles, batteries, early story system, they also come in as DC as well. So they need to be processed before collecting to the grid. So that means more power electronic converters need are uh, being added to the power system. The third challenge, power system needs to be more efficient. That means we need to control the generation, transmission, distribution, and the utilization of electricity. We know that the electricity we use varies at 50 hertz or 60 hertz. In order to control the electricity, that means we need to have a higher bandwidth at, at least a couple of hundred hertz. At the moment, probably the most, um, most important actuators for us to control electricity is power electronics. That means this challenge will bring even more power electronic converters into the power system. So the fundamental challenge behind these challenges uh, is 
that future power systems will be power electronics based instead of electric machines based with a huge number of non-synchronous incompatible players. This is, a power, this is less of a power problem, but more of a systems problem. The challenge is how to make sure that so many different types of players can work together instead of just collecting a wind turbine or solar panel into the grid. The problem is how to make sure so many of them can work together. When we talk about smart grids, we always talk about adding communication network into the power system. However, if the low-level control of these power electronic converters has to rely on communication network, then it's going to create a great concern of reliability and cybersecurity. It's fine for the high-level functions such as SCADA, monitoring, information management, electricity markets, this kind of function to rely on communication network. But if the low-level control has to rely on communication, then that's the end of the story. We, we should definitely stay away with communication network for the low-level control. Then, how are we going to operate our future power systems? In the short video I showed you, I showed you that the harmonizing principle has brought sustainability to China for over 2,000 years. If we want to have sustainability for our power systems, is it possible to harmonize or unify our power system players so that they can bring sustainability to our power systems? Remember that I mentioned that China was highly democratized before being harmonized. And now probably you have heard some regional leaders talking about democratization of power systems. But can we really democratize power systems technically? Democracy, democracy is a political concept that empowers all eligible individuals to play an equal role in decision making. However, significant difference or even divisive op opinions could appear in a democratized society. We have seen several examples in recent years. This is not acceptable for power systems. A power system has to maintain the stability of frequency and voltage. That means all power system players should synchronize their actions for the same goal. That means in addition to democratization, we also need synchronization. This leads to synchronized and democratized smart grids. For a democratized society, there are two important features. One is the rule of law, and the other is called the legal equality. For the rule of law, it means all players should follow the same rule. For the legal equality, it means all players are equal and should be treated equally. So for a sendam smart grid, is there one simple mechanism for all power systems players to follow? If yes, can this mechanism synchronize all the players? As to the legal equality, at the moment, there are many different types of players in a power system. Currently, the system stability is maintained by large conventional power plants. In order to achieve this syndam smart grid, is it possible for new add-ons of generators to play a equal role in maintaining system stability? And also for the loads, not just the generators, is it possible for the most loads to play the same role in regulating system stability as well? And if yes, can this happen regardless of size and capacity? In order to answer these questions, we need to understand what rule has underpinned the operation of power systems for over 100 years. There are many different types of power plants, coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, hydro power plants. But if you go to these power plants, you will find that the generation of electricity is actually dominated by synchronous machines. Then you will be asking yourself, why has the industry decided to use synchronous machines? while there are other machines like DC machines, induction machines. Why has the industry decided to use synchronous machines? It is because synchronous machines have an intrinsic property, very nice feature. 
That is the synchronization mechanism. Synchronous machines are able to synchronize with each other or the grid autonomously without being told or without relying on the communication network. It is this intrinsic synchronization mechanism that has underpinned the operation and growth of power systems for over 100 years. This is nat the natural rule of law if we want to build Sendam smart grid. So the natural rule of law for Sendam grid is the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machine. Now, let's look at the legal equality of all the players. Let's start with the new add-ons of generation. There are different types of renewable energy, like wind, solar, tide, elect wave, and others. There are also electric vehicles, energy storage systems that can generate electricity and collect to the grid. They are all different. They have all different characteristics, and their control is very challenging. But today, I'm more interested in on the commonalities among these different things. So my question is that, is there anything in common among all these different things? You probably know that these distributed generations, they need to collect to the grid through something called power electronic inverters. A power electronic inverter is a common device for all these types of smart grid integration. And the power electronic inverter converts the DC electricity, VDC, uh, into AC by operating the power electronic devices, turning them on and off. And then you get a sinusoidal signal on the right-hand side. But of course, you will have some harmonics. These harmonics can be handled by this low-pass filter, the LC filter, the LC filter. So we have found a common device for the smart grid integration of all these different distributed generators. Then the question is that, are we able to equip these inverters to have the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines? Is it possible to do that? And the answer is yes. We are able to equip the synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines with these inverters. What we do is to operate power electronic converters as virtual synchronous machines to have the internal dynamics and the external properties of synchronous machines. So far, we have developed three generations of virtual synchronous machines. The first generation of virtual synchronous machines is called synchroverters. And this is a basic and conceptual design of virtual synchronous machines four converters with inductive impedances. We know that power electronic converters can have different types of impedances. It could be inductive, capacitive, or resistive, or even com complex. So in order to make sure that all these different types of converters can work together, we need to find a universal controller or universal virtual synchronous machine. And then we had this second generation of virtual synchronous machines based on our robust supercontroller. We have proven that the robust supercontroller is universal for converters with different types of uh, impedances, whether it's resistive, capacitive, inductive, or complex. It doesn't really matter. And also, it's robust against the parameter change, shifts, components mismatches. And stability is always a concern of us, right? We, all, we are always worried about the stability, and we too. So we have developed the third generation of virtual synchronous machines. We call it passive virtual synchronous machine or cyber sync machines. And these synchronous machines, okay, these virtual synchronous machines are passive and hence stable, stable. So today, because of the time limit, I will mainly talking about the first generation of virtual synchronous machines, that is the synchronous converters. But I will briefly talk about the third generation of virtual synchronous machine as well later. So, the basic concept of a synchronous synchroverter is to take the mathematical model of a synchronous generator as the core of the controller for an inverter. And the mathematical model of the inverter, uh, of the synchronous generator is shown on the bottom left as a block diagram. By the way, I don't have an equation in this talk. I only have block diagrams. So this block diagram, the upper part shows you the swing equation, and the lower part shows you calculations of the um, electromagnetic torque, the reactive power Q, the generator voltage E, 
And with the inputs coming from the state current I, the field uh, excitation current MFIF. So this is the mathematical model of synchronous generator. We use it as a core of the controller for a inverter. And then we convert the generated voltage E into pulses to turn these switches on and off, to these power electron devices on and off. Okay? And then generates the voltage E A E B E C on the on the midpoint of these bridges, so that the average values of this E A E B E C over a switching period is the same as the generated voltage E. And then we measure the output current flowing through the inductors, I A I B S C, and feed them back to the mathematical model as the state current I. So in this way, we have collected the mathematical model of a synchronous generator with the hardware of the power electronic converter. And then we can adopt the matured technologies we have developed for synchronous machines over the 100 years. That is mainly the frequency tube control and the voltage tube control. So what we have done um, is to add a summation block on the top right to compare the frequency of the synchroverter theta dot with the reference frequency, okay? Because we found that the virtual frequency coefficient dp has got the rule of frequency drop control. We have added a block to convert the real power into mechanical torque TM to regulate the real power. And then we added an integrator to regulate the field excitation current MFIF. And so that we are able to regulate the reactive power. Also, we can add a voltage tube control at the bottom through the DQ to regulate the voltage. So in this very compact controller, we are able to control the frequency, control the voltage, the real power, and the reactive power, and the reactive power here. In this original synchroverter, we had a PLL on the top right corner, the phase lock loop, to provide the grid frequency and the phase for pre-synchronization before collecting to the grid. But later research, we have found that we can get rid of these phase lock loops, okay? Then we did experiments in the UK, where I was in uh, Liverpool University, and we found that we have demonstrated that indeed, synchroverters has excellent frequency regulation capability. It is able to regulate the frequ uh, frequency uh, nicely, okay? The red line is the frequency when we were doing the experiments. The black line is the real power sent by the virtual synchronous machine. And you can see that the real power automatically changed according to the varying frequency. This is exactly the frequency regulation capability required by utility companies. And similarly, we can do the voltage regulation as well. So that means all the generators can now be harmonized with the intrinsic synchronization mechanism and equal, so that they can equally take part in the grid regulation, whether it's a wind turbine, solar panel, or electric vehicle. So, how about the loads? How about the loads? There are different types of loads in a power system, like home appliances, lighting devices, elevators, air conditioners, different types of machines. The modeling of these different types of loads is very challenging, and it's a bottleneck for power system stability analysis. And today, my concern, our concern is that, is there anything in common among these different types of loads? Are we able to find something common for them? I found a report from EPRI, the Electrical Power Race Institute of the US. It says that although there are different types of loads, but about 50% or slightly more of the electricity is consumed by different types of motors. About 10% of the electricity is consumed by internal devices. 20% by lighting devices. And the rest of loads consume the rest of 20% of electricity. That is very interesting, that is very interesting. You probably still remember that I said the third challenge we are facing in power system is that we need to make power system more efficient. If we want to make the loads more efficient, then of course, the first thing we would like to look at is the motors, okay? We can improve the efficiency by redesigning the motors. But another way is to add a motor drive to the motors so that we can change the speed of the motors according to the requirements and loads, okay? A motor drive is a power electronic converter with the rectifier at the front end. 
So that means in the future, probably this electricity, 50% or more electricity will be consumed by rectifiers. Internet devices are electronic devices. So they consume DC electricity as well. That means this 10% of electricity will be con is consumed by rectifier as well. Lighting devices, 20% of electricity consumption. We all know that the lighting market, market is moving towards LED lights. LED lights consume DC electricity, so there is a rectifier in every LED light. That means this 20% of electricity is going to be consumed by rectifiers as well. Or in other words, in the future, about 80% or even 90% of electricity is going to be consumed by rectifiers, whatever the end function is. So if we are able to make these loads or the rectifiers to behave like virtual synchronous motors, then most loads will become frequency sensitive, and they can have the synchronization mechanism we need. We managed to operate rectifiers as a virtual synchronous motors. What we did is similar to the synchronous motor concept. We adopted the mathematical model of a synchronous motor as the core of the controller for, a, for the rectifier. And then we added a very small controller at the front end, the PI controller, to regulate the DC bus voltage. V0, so that it regulates to the reference voltage VREF. And of course, we can also add the reactive power regulation to regulate the reactive power Q through this integrator and to change the field excitation current. And if you want, you can even add the voltage control to the controller as well. And we tested this in the lab, and we found that indeed it works as we expected. So the blue line in the first curve is the frequency inside the rectifier. It follows the red frequency that is from the grid very well. You can see the red line is behind the blue line. It's, it's uh, very difficult to differentiate it because it's so close to each other. And the, we are able to regulate the DC bus voltage very well as well. So that means indeed we are able to control the rectifiers as virtual synchronous motors. Indeed, in this way, most nodes can be equipped with a synchronization mechanism and play a equal role in regulating system stability. So, we have achieved legal equality. Whether they are conventional or new add-on generators, whether they are generators or loads, whether they are large or small, they can all behave like virtual synchronous machines or synchronous machines and follow the same rule of law the synchronization mechanism. Now, it's time to show you the Sendam grid architecture we have proposed. This a synchronized and democratized smart grids has got this architecture. So in, a, in this architecture, the conventional power plants, the coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, hydro power plants on the top of this graph, they can be collected to the grid in the conventional way without much change through conventional synchronous machines, SM. For the new add-ons of generations, wind turbines, solar panels, DC microgrids, electric vehicles, early storage systems, you can control the inverters as virtual synchronous machines so that they can behave like virtual synchronous machines. And for the rectified, for the loads, we can control the rectifiers as virtual synchronous machines as well. For the high voltage DC links, they have two power electronic converters. So we can control both converters as a virtual synchronous machine as well. So one as a virtual synchronous generator, one as a virtual synchronous motor. Now, if you look at all these active players from inside this graph or from the transmission and distribution network, whatever you see will have the mathematical mode of a synchronous machine. So that means we have arrived at a unified or harmonized architecture. These active players can work with each other autonomously to regulate the system stability without relying on communication network. That's wonderful. So we have made a super large scale of complex power systems with many heterogeneous players to be operated with 
one goal, that is the stability, with one principle, that is the harmonizing, and one action, that is to turn power converters into virtual synchronous machines. With the synchronization mechanism, and arriving with a lateral architecture. So, I want to point out that synchronicity is a beauty. This architecture is lateral, rather than hierarchical. It's very interesting. This is a, a lateral architecture, or a flat architecture. And this actually provides a technical solution to implement the lateral power envisioned by Jeremy Rifkin for the third industrial revolution. There are a lot of benefits that can be brought over by the Sendam smart grids. For example, now all generators and most loads, not just the large generators, actively take part in the grid regulation. So that means the stability is improved. And this is a harmonized system governed by the same mechanism. It brings the scalability. The low level control does not rely on communication network. It enhances the reliability and the cyber security. Virtual synchronous machines are power electronic converters, so which can quickly respond to disturbances without delay. That means enhancing the resiliency. Virtual synchronous machines only require local information, not global not information from other places. So that means it is able to achieve genuine plug and play and the interoperability. You probably will be surprised that the hardware cost incurred while we change the power converters into virtual synchronous machines is actually negligible. You don't need to add much cost to that. So that is great. So it's economically viable. This Sendam structure framework brings the harmonization of the integration of renewable sources. So that means it's contributing to the sustainability of our planet. I mentioned a little bit about the economic viability, but let me give you more uh, evidence about the potential economic benefits. This Sendam framework is able to reduce or defer infrastructure investment significantly on the generation, transmission, and distribution. For example, the capacity of the Texas airport grid is about 70 gigawatts. And if the load in that network contributes 1%, in contingencies, which is negligible for each individual load, then the total contribution is 700 megawatts. This is actually larger than the maximum capacity of the, all the intercollection. The maximum is 650. So that means any of these intercollection trips off, the airport grid will not fill it because all the loads will be able to actively take part in regulation and maintain the stability. Now, let's look at another significant benefit is that it saves the operational cost on reserves. We all know that reserves are very important for the operation of power systems. And we always say that, okay, we don't have enough inertia in the power system when we have these renewables. But actually, it's different. For example, if there are 10 million laptops collected in a grid, and each can contribute 10 watts when needed, this is equivalent to have 100 megawatt of total equivalent reserve. That's a lot. And of course, we have a lot of big machines, wind turbines, and other things in the power system. So the equivalent reserve is a lot, is a lot, okay? We should, the problem is that nowadays we are not utilizing this reserve. With the Sendam framework, we are able to release this reserve and utilize this reserve for stability. This Sendam framework is also able to save infrastructure investment on communication and cybersecurity, as I mentioned, because the low-level control does no longer rely on communication network. So the boundaries of the communication network is significantly reduced. And also, it is able to increase the on time of renewable generators and reduce the maintenance cost. There are some other benefits which I'm not going to mention here. Okay. Now, we have carried out some other uh, latest developments, for example, uh, I mentioned that we have got rid of the phase lock loop, so you no longer need a phase lock loop for power electronic converters. We have mathematically proven why we can get rid of the phase lock loops. We have also characterized the stability rating of the original sync converters, and we have developed a second generation of the virtual synchronous machines based on robust loop controller. 
And recently, we have developed a strategy to limit the current of the power converters because you know that when we talk about power electronic converters, we say, okay, power electronics are very vulnerable to overcurrent. But now we have got control strategies to make sure that the, control, the current will not go beyond a given value. And also we have developed this third generation of virtual synchronous machines, what we call the CyberSync machines, which is uh, passive. And now you're probably wondering whether I can give you some stability uh, proof, and I do have some slides here for you, okay? But in order to do that, we need a new mathematical tool, what we call the ghost operator we introduced recently. The ghost operator is a very simple operator, actually. It shifts the phase of a sine function or a cosine function by 90 degrees. That means if you apply the ghost operator to a sine function, you get cosine function. If you apply it to a cosine function, you get minus sine function. If you apply the ghost operator twice, you get its opposite. And it is, uh, some people may say, okay, it's uh, quite similar to the imaginary operator, but no, it's not. The ghost operator gives you the um, real values, but the imaginary operator gives you the imaginary numbers. And this is a simple graph to show you uh, how the ghost operator applies to the uh, cosine function. It's different from the uh, imaginary operator. So, with this ghost operator, we are able to prove the passivity of the uh, virtual synchronous machine. And this is the third generation of the virtual synchronous machine, which we call cyber sync machines. It has got two channels. Uh, on the left, with, uh, one is a torque frequency channel. The bottom channel is called court flux channel. This court is a new name, new, new English word we created to represent the dual variable of the torque. Okay, so you say torque, court. Okay. Um, <clears throat> on the right hand side, we have an engendering block called a sigma E. That is to generate the output voltage E and the torque T and the court gamma as feedback uh, signals. We put these two signals back to the two channels. So the important thing here is that we design the two channels on the left to, be, uh, to form a passive block, sigma C. The engineering block, sigma E, uh, is a lot, unfortunately, lot lossless, lossless, okay? So in order to make it lossless, we have to introduce the ghost plant of a real plant. Okay, I repeat, ghost plant. And the ghost plant is nothing else but the original plant, PS, which is the original plant cascaded with the ghost operator as the input, okay? So the ghost plant is the original plant cascaded with the ghost operator as its input. If the input signal of the, to the ghost plant is the ghost signal of the original plant, then the state of the ghost will be symmetric to the uh, original state, original plant. That is very interesting. So that's why we call it ghost, okay? It's always opposite to the original thing. By doing this, we can form a block, sigma P, um, by the combination of the original plant and the ghost plant. And this is actually passive, if the original plant is passive. And what's more important is that the block in, the in between sigma C and sigma P what we call it the intercollection block, is actually lossless. That is very surprising, okay? And of course, this is what we wanted to have. So that means the left block and the right block are both passive, and the block in the middle to intercollect these two blocks is lossless. So according to the Port Hamiltonian system theory, the system with a cybersync machine is passive. I would really like to point out that this port Hamiltonian system theory is really, really powerful. I have been um, tracking, uh, look, um, um, tracking this research in the area for many years, but only recently we have managed to do something nice here. Okay, so the system with a cybersync machine is passive. That's great, and of course, then it's uh, stable, okay? So, we, we have built up academic test beds and industrial test beds to validate the SENDAM framework. And the State Grid Corporation of China also started a, a large scale industrial demonstration uh, for uh, the virtual synchronous machines. This is the SENDAM smart grid we developed at my lab, research lab in Illinois Institute of Technology. It consists of 10 nodes collected together. 
So in, you know, in which two wind turbines, two solar panels, two active DC loads, two active AC loads, and two loads which are connected to the grid to exchange the energy with the grid. So we have managed to operate this system stably without any problem. Uh, we have built up all the uh, inverters, the, the power electronic converters from scratch using our topologies and our technologies. So we are ready to, to make this, um, uh, to expand these systems. And I have also worked with my collaborator, Baby Zen at Texas Tech University to build up a larger academic test bed. In the, um, her team has built up this bed with one solar panels, you can see from the, at the bottom left, one wind turbine, one generator, one LED storage, and some loads, and one uh, load collector grade. And you can see from the curves, and um, the system is able to operate stably with a stable frequency and the voltage. And I have also worked with my collaborators, uh, Brian and Greg, at the National Instruments to test this syndam framework in their uh, industrial IoT test bed. And we, we spent three days on that, on that test bed and managed to in, uh, implement our syndam uh, algorithm and make it work. And the first day when we made it work, we left it running overnight and without any problem. Last year, State Grid Corporation of China initiated a large-scale virtual synchronous machine demonstration in Zhangbei, China, where the 2022 Olympic Winter Games will be held. This includes deploying virtual synchronous machines for 435 megawatt wind turbines, 12 megawatt solar panels, 10 megawatt LED storage systems. And the project is expected to finish by the end of this year. I'm really looking forward to see the promising results from this large scale demonstration. Let's now have a look, uh, revisit the uh, South Australia blackout. And say if we would have, we had um, deployed the send them um, uh, technology there and what, what's going to happen. Of course, we cannot avoid the tornadoes, faults, voltage dips, but the damage can be contained. Wind turbines operated at the virtual synchronous machines are grid friendly and will endeavor to remain collected instead of tripping off after several uh, voltage dips. Most loads will automatically change their power intakes to response, in response to the event. So as a result, the chance of having the blackout would have been greatly reduced. We have established the framework for future power systems based on the Sendam uh, framework, okay? However, this is just the beginning. Roughly speaking, anything done in this area can be revisited under this unified Sendam architecture. Example, to develop other te technical routes to prove the stability of the whole power system mathematically, to quantify the performances, to optimize the global or local um, indices or the power flows, or reduce the system models while preserving the structure. And of course, this is a new paradigm for operating future power systems. It means a lot of uh, practices in power system needs to be adjusted accordingly. I do not expect a huge change, but some adapt adaptation needs to be done there. And of course, the cybersecurity issue is now different because the low level control no longer relies on communication networks. That means there's low security, low cyber security problem at the low level control. And the demand response is interesting. So far, we can only do on-off demand response, but now you can have continuous demand response, okay? You don't have to cut, uh, shut off your de de demand completely. You can just uh, sacrifice, let's say, 1% or 2% of electricity consumption. And this small contribution from each node will uh, make a huge contribution to the stability of the society. Another thing I would like to emphasize is the potential application of the ghost operator. We have recently used this ghost operator to interpret the physical meaning of real power. You know that the real power uh, has a lot been physically uh, de defined. And we have used it and uh, uh, did some nice work there. And I think that, uh, I feel that there's some other potential application of this uh, ghost operator. I, so because of this, we have made it open 
accessible, so you can download the paper from I2B without paying a penny. Okay. I'm sure you are waiting for some equation, right? Uh, I said that I, don't, I didn't have any equation in this talk. But if you really want to see some equations, you can find them here, okay? We have two research model graphs uh, here. Okay, the first one, uh, the one on the left is control power inverters in renewable energy and smart grid integration. It includes a lot of enabling control technologies for power inverters. It includes the power quantity control, power flow control, neutral line provision, and synchronization. Um, we have another book coming out on the right hand side that is the power electronics labeled autonomous power systems. It, in, it includes details of my talk today. And uh, it's going to include the, all these three generations of virtual synchronous machines, the stability proof, and all these things there. I, I imagine that it's going to be like 500 pages or more, okay? Um, it's going to be a nice book, I'm, I assure you, okay? Good things, what's the weight? So it's, hopefully it's going to come out the any next year. Now, let me summarize my talk, okay? Uh, power systems are being democratized. Numerous distributed generators and flexible loads are being collected to the uh, system to take part in the grid regulation. And future power systems will be power electronics based instead of electric machines based with a huge number of incompatible players. In order to guarantee stability, power systems should have synchronization as well, okay, in, uh, not just this democratization. So we need to have synchronized and democratized smart grids. The key features of a, a democratized society has been achieved for Sendam smart grids. We have adopted this synchronization mechanism of synchronous machines as a natural rule of law, and we have achieved the uh, legal economy by operating power electronic converters as virtual synchronous machines. We have presented the natural system architecture and we have presented three generations of uh, virtual synchronous machines technology. Here are some takeaway messages. Life is really simple, but we insist, insist on making it complicated. This is a quote from Confucius. I really like simple stuff, and I do think that we have an option to make things simple instead of making things complicated. And in this case, we have one goal, stability, one principle, the harmonizing, and one action, the virtual synchronous machines, and one mechanism, the synchronization mechanism, and we ended up with the architecture that is uh, natural. And I mentioned that this time of research has been ongoing for 15 years, and I have the privilege to work with uh, several um, talented and visionary leaders in this field, and I really would like to thank them for their collaboration. And I also have some uh, contributions from my PhD students and postdocs. They have helped validate some of the concepts we had. And of course, I would like to thank the funding agencies who supported us in the past. And I have had the luck to work with several major international companies um, to support our research in the past. And I really appreciate the support. And I look forward to working with them uh, in the future. And the 100 second video from the beginning, um, we edited it, prepared it from uh, materials available from the internet. Here, I formally acknowledge their contribution to that video. So, I have shown you that we can all make contributions to our sustainability, but we are not able to do this by our own. We need all, everybody, you to join us to make our planet sustainable. If you want to learn more about this area to load the latest updates, you can join the LinkedIn group we set up for virtual synchronous machines. And in order to speed up this commercialization process, we have set up a company called Sendam LLC to develop, further develop the technologies and make the technology available so that we can deploy Sendam smart grids worldwide. If you are interested in this, please let us know, and we will be very happy to work with you to make contributions to our, the sustainability of our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for this evidence, okay? Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Song, for this uh, stimulating uh, talk. Uh, the organizers have informed me that there's no uh, questions at the end of plenaries and semi-plenaries, but I'm sure Professor Zong uh, is available if you want to talk to him privately. So please join me in thanking him again. <laughs>